yeah, this one's Corey Taylor and Tom Segura, comedian. I'm sure many people know Tom Segura, but um, yeah, it's more just him talking about a lot of stuff people have already heard before, but also just like current events like Jane's addiction. And he talks about Dave Grohl and music, his like music mind, and just little shit. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but there's a couple clips in there that are good. The guy who really saw the potential for us at Roadrunner, Monty Connor, he was somebody who there were several bands that he tried to sign that went on to get signed at other places. Yeah. So I think that was one of the ways that he was able to get us on Roadrunners because they, they saw the missed opportunities. Yeah. Also, we were working with Ross, who at the time was, you know, a god, you know, yeah. just in that in that genre period. You know, he's just one of the greatest ears for like primal, like emotional sludge metal, you mm -hmm. know, and that's. Let's talk about Ross Robinson for a second, because that guy, first of all, Corn was like his first big break, but then he did Limp Biscuit. Yeah. Um, I mean, hold on. I'm going to. I know it. later on he did. No, he did that one Norma Jean album, Redeemer. Yeah, he did. Um, there's a couple other good albums he's done that are just. Glass uh, Jaw was another one. So, okay, let's see. Albums produced. These are just produced. So, wow. Oh, this is 91. Okay, holy shit. He yeah, did, he did. Yeah. Crimson Idol by Wasp. So, Corn, Corn was like 1994. Corn's debut album was like what he did at Deftones Adrenaline production on Fist. He did Sepultura Roots. He did Corn Life is Peachy. He did $3 Bill, y'all, Limp Biscuit. He did Soulfly. He did Cold. Uh, Vanilla Ice's return. <laughs> After Limp Biscuit got famous, Vanilla Ice came back as like a rap rock guy, hard yeah. to swallow. And then uh, he did Slipknot's album in 99. Then he did The Burning Red. That's the Machine Head record, record where they went kind of like rap rock a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 2000 he did everything you wanted did to know you about. say he did adrenaline by deftones he did one song on it it says oh, uh okay. he did the song fist production on fist okay um but he also Ooh. did so everything you wanted to know about silence uh glass job but then relationship of command at yeah. the drive-in roots uh then he did iowa slipknot also amen is in here amen was like a band that was huge in la when i first moved there uh and they like were not that good. I never really got. He did why. the cure too. He did worship and tribute by Glassjaw. He Which did. I think Corey actually talks about the cure in here. Too. Wow, he did Blood Brothers, Burn, Piano Island, Burn, Team Sleep, Chino's Project, Redeemer, Norma Jean in two thousand six. Um, wow, he's so. He, anyway, point being, Ross Robinson is the man. Let's keep going on this. Yeah, I mean. The Cure album he did is insane. Which one did he do? He did Blood Flowers. Wow. It's so incredible. Really? Um, it's, yeah, and it's one of the darkest yeah. Cure albums fucking nice. ever. So it's um, also, I think, so good for artists to hear. Like in yeah. any lane, when you hear like stories like, like that story of you guys performing, yeah, is like, because, like, you know, it's not the same, but it kind of is like in comedy too. Right. You just do these gigs that are just fucking brutal right yeah, and yeah. like if somebody there's people who see you at them who are like yeah, don't quit your day job okay right and you have to push through it right like you have to go like you you're like no this is what i do and, right and and there's shit gigs are part of it you know but right. you when people go like you don't have it you still have to fucking believe which you is do. which is fucked up and then yeah. dealing with peers coming up at the same time and yes. then suddenly you start to rise above them the passive aggressiveness that you guys have to to deal with that we've yeah you know, i'm sure you guys have dealt with that yeah. where it's like almost like the jealousy part it's like dude we were friends like why are you coming at me going it's like oh okay you know and you just yeah like yeah. and we got it first in our hometown and then we got it from Hold on. The I bands. iowa you're from des moines, des moines. yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Des Moines haters. Yeah, man. Well, Dang. and trust me, they fucking hate. They still they, hate us. They, they do. still hate us. Yeah. Really? Um, Small town haters. It's and it's weird too Wait, so because would you say after Iowa it was then what? Um I don't know. I mean, it, after Iowa it would have been the bands on Roadrunner. Ah, uh, okay. Who were the bands that we loved, man? Yeah, you know, like, oh, you're the big shot now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then 
it, it, it slowly. When Slipknot took off too, they they got so big so fast. Like it was just like a fucking wildfire. And that record that record took off because it was good. It was so good. It changed. It changed the course of heavy. Like he said, it changed metal for sure. That's one of those records that changed. Definitely, metal. no doubt about it. Fully balanced out. You know, but at the same time, you know, what people don't realize is that we went back home and tried to help those bands in Des Moines, like tried to give them a platform. We got three or four of those bands signed and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Yeah. We took all of those Roadrunner bands out with us. The second that we started to get bigger, we were like, let's go, man. Let's all of us go. And it became... I don't want to say salacious, but at the same time, it was just tragic how quick the egos would turn. And I'm just as bad, you know, but at the same time, we were really trying to put, we were trying to balance out maybe the guilt of like blowing up the way we did with trying to help out the bands that we loved, you know, and it wasn't all of them, you know, it was, we, we still have a lot of friends from a lot of those bands that were on that, on that <clears> label, <throat> but we definitely were put in a situation where it was almost lose lose and all we could do was just kind of band together and just say all right fuck it let's just go we're yeah. just which was definitely the yeah. right decision there's well, yeah, nothing more exactly. you can do exactly but also to celebrate your 20 so um let's the next clip you had here was of young Corey joining slipknot yeah he's told this story before but it's interesting like about how he kind of like you know, realized he wanted to be in Slipknot and all that stuff. Just his upbringing, because how fucked up I was. Because he, like, he fights for everybody. He really like, does. He doesn't fuck around. Yeah. Um, Wait, so let's go back to you, because I've been intrigued with Slipknot for so long. I really have, like, I've, you, you're from Iowa. Mm -hmm. I know that. I know you have, like, a rough childhood stuff mm -hmm. yeah. yes you go through a lot of shit can yeah. you give me like i mean i don't know how much you want to talk about but what's what's the snapshot and then how brilliant that you parlay that into this really unique music that resonates with so many right. other angry fucked up kids it's so great it's interesting um when i was younger i didn't realize that i had a propensity for like heavy music like i when i started Kind of teaching myself how to play i just wanted to kind of play songs and play it's very much like my solo stuff basically um but because of the background that i had you know just like growing up abused all all categories um and then being homeless um od twice by the time i was 16 uh and my friends left me in a dumpster in a dumpster yeah yeah, it was, and I think it was only because they moved me that I actually was able to stay alive. Because then I woke up. Because they were like, we just got to put yeah, the body somewhere. Yeah, they were just like, we can't take him. Yeah, they just left me in a dumpster. That's messed up. Yeah, it's a crazy that's the kind story. of stuff that would have happened in Utah, though. Like, like all these small town America places. That's where. Yeah, they thought he was dead, so they tossed him in a dumpster. They yeah. didn't know what to do. So that's insane. So, all of that. You kind of look at that and then I fast forward to I'm doing music with my original band Stone Sour, but there was always something that was kind of like, I was almost like kind of pulling at the chain. You know, I just like, I wanted something more. So when I see Slipknot play their very first show. I was right like front row and I've never had this thought since and I'd never had it before that, but I was like, I'm going to be the singer for this band. Really? Yeah. And how old are you? I was at the time I was 23 and then two years later they asked me to join what? which was crazy yeah you know because we all knew each other you know I mean so you did you did know those guys yeah yeah, yeah. we were all like Slipknot what a lot of people might not know is like Slipknot was made up of a lot of people from the scene you know and we all knew each other we'd all played shows together but we also recognized the people in each band who that guy's driven. Mm. That guy's hungry. That guy's talented as fuck. And that's what your band's made up of. Exactly. We were the dudes who were 
we would have stepped on the necks of our dead mothers to fucking get there. <laughs> yeah. You have to. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's the why you're Damn. part of why you're there. And yep. I think it's also one of the reasons why we were so ferocious in the beginning. Like we have very little memory of the first year and a half that we toured because we were so just go, you know? I mean, I saw a home maybe a month and a half in that whole time because we were just fucking gone the entire time. It played every <clears throat> territory that would let us in. Even the places that were that banned us, we would play like the borders. See, and it's like we listening to this, like it just reminds me of playing in my old band and how people like people glamorize being in a band and it can be a great thing, but you have to understand that like it's not just gonna happen overnight. Like you need to play every show you can play. You need to go talk to anyone that you can. Well, like, like, you know what I mean? Like, you can't just pick and choose or, like, you know. And obviously, it, any band that's successful will tell you that. So this is just a reminder from Corey Taylor. They Probably one of the biggest, Slipknot, it's arguably one of the biggest, like, heavy, heavy metal bands ever. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I mean, Metallica's know. big, but Slipknot is, like, heavy and like, yeah. They're, they never like, had a definitely. black album or anything. They never yeah. had like I mean they've got well, like softer, they've done you know what I mean? But yeah, they, they've done some soft shit for sure. Like Vermilion or whatever. But but when you think of Slipknot, you think of Iowa and you think of their first record and you think of maybe like duality and that kind of shit. But I mean they're touring on the first record right now and filling stadiums like huge yeah, venues. So exactly. Skrillex spoke about it when he won the Grammy recently. He was like, I never looked for success i never like i just did try yeah and that happened like i never chased money and money followed like i just did what i love he he dropped out of high school like yeah he he has a long story too because he was in that band from first to last before yeah, he went yeah, on his exactly. own and really saw success like that guy probably toured in a van for several years before he became skrillex and was like oh i well, can fill that stadium mindset with a gave him the like you know, the, like being yeah. in a, I'm sure he doesn't regret a day of it. No, I guarantee he doesn't. Well, let's listen to a little bit more of this. In Greece for the longest time. So we would just play in Greece. Around. A yeah. whole country. Greece. Well, you gotta well, keep these that play, well, that place was this so was convinced that we were satanic. Oh, really? That oh <laughs> they, they take that shit very seriously, man. So I was like, all right. They finally let us in and we played like this. I'm getting off topic a little bit. We played this like crazy amazing like um amphitheater like this uh -huh. natural amphitheater and dude people were like the, it's the it's a sheer mountain on the other side yeah. like and people are climbing and coming over the top to get to our show and i'm just looking it's like this is wow. some shit out of world war z like it was wow. nuts <laughs> um but to go back so this is the music when i thing. joined that yeah, band yeah. i honestly had it was almost like i had to re relearn everything that i knew about making music because this was just a hot yeah man because they were so there were no bounds no boundaries when it came to music you know we if we wanted to use you know death metal punk mm -hmm. hardcore hip-hop goth mm -hmm. electronica well, can i ask you this about, about that because this is really fascinating yeah. and that like you know if you take um a guy that plays keyboard right and maybe piano or whatever and 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 maybe there's a songwriter sometimes the songwriting will be like hey i got this melody right and then the songwriter will go like okay i i think you know and then he uses the melody and goes and it's like it's like a easy to understand pro even as right. a non-musician you're right. like oh i get it like right. you're hearing the melody and then you're gonna write some words right but when you have like your size band and and all the elements like how do you construct a song it's it, it's interesting um because a lot of it kind of comes down to in the beginning we would just go we would get in the room and go who's got an idea mm. and nine times out of ten it would either be mick or joey actually who would have a riff and it's like check you know check this out check this yeah, out joey was and we would start to just as well. r.i.p r.i.p yeah, joey joey jordison Oh. And we would just worry at it and worry at it and, and build worry on it. At it. Exactly. Um, when we did Wait and Bleed, 
they came to me and they were like, we want you to just write the chorus. So I wrote the chorus and they constructed the guitar riff over it, that, oh, okay. which was really cool. So there, so it was the- That's interesting. Cause that's yeah. arguably one of the more pop leaning songs on the record. Well, and he, I didn't put it in here, a clip about it. I'm, I should have, but um, there's a part where he talks about MTV and how Wait and Bleed was they uh, the only song that they, the first song I think that they allowed the music video for from them. Like they didn't let them put Spit It Out on MTV. Yeah. Or anything. So I think that's farther back. So no need to go back. First taste for me that there was no rules. It's exciting, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, once you kind of throw off those constraints, yeah. uh, the fucking world is your, you, it's your bitch, basically. Yeah. You know, so to answer your question, sometimes if you hear, if, at least for me, if you hear a really amazing chorus, the melody will just come to you. And it and it's you just hear it instinctively in your head, and you just kind of start to fuck with it. You fine tune it and you perfect it. Hear so it. let's jump to this other clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. So anyway, they're talking about the the songwriting process. So he he talks a little bit about our good friend Dave Grawl. Of course. I've got another confession to make. That's our that's our new Dave Grawl sound drop. So yeah, yeah, yeah. here's what Corey had to say about the Dave Grawl situation. What about Dave Grohl? What's up with his baby mama shit? Oh. Dude, I'm so but let me tell you something, bro. He's like, here, why did you ask me that? Take. No, it's no, let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, okay? Like, I apropos of this earlier discussion of like, you guys are fucking rock stars. You're knocking shit over. Right. Old bitches be falling and spraining their ankles. <laughs> but right. but she knows, hey, that's fucking slipped out over there, honey. Right. You better be careful. So I feel like this whole, I'm just a nice guy. I'm, I'm a nice guy. Like, bitch, no, you're not. You're a rock star. Right. And you fucking impregnate bitches. Fine. Because that's what they do. That's what they've been doing for the 70s, the 80s. Like, why come out with a statement announcing this to everybody? And secondly, why are you busting nuts in your side piece, bro? All valid questions, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I was hoping are. it would yeah. come up. Yeah. Get a vasectomy. Um, it's oh, fuck, dude. It's so messy. Yeah. Like just one hundred percent messy. And you do know yeah. Dave Grohl. I do know Dave Grohl. So um, he is one of the nicest people on the planet. And heard it many times. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Sometimes. Was that what was it? Mistakes were made, Mistakes Christina. Were I made. mean, and. I don't listen. I, I'll tell you exactly why they put out a press release. Yeah, because well, I'm so confused. Because he wanted to get ahead of it. He wanted to get ahead of it because he knew that if he didn't say something, somebody else was going to say something. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we even know who the baby mama is, right? Not yet, by the time this. But out. I can guarantee you, as soon as she finds out that he may or may not be a part of everything, she was going to say something, mm. and. It's called controlling the narrative. Mm -hmm. So he got ahead of it. Um, and, you know, I will say this. Obviously, it's very irresponsible. And I know there are a lot of disappointed fans out there yeah. because of because of the the image that he has developed, you know. But I have to remind people that we're not perfect, you know. He was one of the last people to really have that image. Because mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you can't really think of anyone else. I mean, well, I Bill know. Cosby was the last oh, guy. Yeah. The whoa, 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 Headline of this piece, Corey Taylor compares Dave Grohl to Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say this was before the inter interwebs. Yeah. So it can't ruin my life. It's Let's a different it time. Way. Yes. It's exactly. A different era. Not I everybody had their this. fucking phone out. Yeah. Dude, like, let's just say, like, there's some crazy shit. Yeah, but, of course. Of course. Yeah. That's why you I become mean, a rock star. That's why you become a fucking Exactly. You know, I, I have very strong opinions about a lot of that shit. It's like, and what's your name? Amen. Oh, oh, I don't, just, I don't want to hear your name. It's like, it was just a different scene man yeah you know and people don't realize that you if you it's it's like it's like watching a movie from the 60s it's like watching a bond film and then judging it based on modern yeah 
principles yes. it doesn't fucking work that no, way man. Yeah. like yeah. you cannot do that with someone in that age you know, you know what's funny I, I, I want to i want to stop here for a second because i got into a twitter fight with someone earlier about this because they were talking about george washington yeah. and what they're like george washington is a piece of shit he had slaves teeth and i'm like everyone had slaves motherfucker yeah and again i'm like dude it was the 1800s man it was a different time i'm not saying that i support him having slaves teeth or that 100%. it was cool but also like you have to remember like cuz he's like well julian assange is a good person and i'm like well dude Julian Assange also didn't live in the 1800s, you know, and I was like, there people call him a Russian and, a, you know, all these different things. And so it's like the, sh the shit he's saying here about about that stuff, like it's like people you have to view like the founding fathers, like they had slaves. Yeah. Everyone at that time had slaves. Exactly. That's so saying. that doesn't. Yeah. I, I mean, if you judge people in those eras and that's what I said, look, look at how much this country has changed since like the 1950s. You know what I mean? Like women used to not even be able to vote. 